All right. Good day. Uh, ILM 3103032K measurement turbine flow meters is the subject du jour. Um, let's look at what we're going to look at today, which is pretty standard now. Describe the principles and applications of turbine meters, components of turbine meters, installation requirements for turbine meters, maintenance, calibration of turbine meters, and advantages and limitations of turbine meters. So I am going to assume a good percentage of the people that are going to be watching this presentation have probably seen a turbine meter. They're very common uh, in the oil and gas industry here in Alberta, so high likelihood that you've seen them. Um, they vary in sizes from relatively small, half inch up to several inches um, and they're pretty common in the oil and gas business here so the basic turbine looks something like what we have on the screen here uh, within a casing body of some type we have a turbine suspended in the flow path and as flow comes by and impinges on the blades of the rotor which are pitched it causes them to turn as this blade turns uh, the motion is detected by some type of a pickup, um, which counts uh, pulses that are outputted by the uh, device and are proportional to the volumetric flow rate and velocity going through that pipe. So uh, in terms of complexity, they're not too bad. Uh, they are a little bit delicate, but uh, generally pretty easy to understand. Principle of operation. Again, turbine meter consists of a multi-bladed rotor, the spinning part suspended in the fluid stream on a free running bearing. And we'll talk about different kinds of bearings that are used to support um, that rotor. The axis of rotation is perpendicular to the flow, which makes perfect sense. The rotor blades sweep out nearly to the full bore of the meter, very close tolerances. And that fluid impinging on the rotor blade causes the rotor to revolve. The speed of the road rotation is generally sensed by some type of an electromagnetic pickup and we'll talk about a couple of different times or types of pickups uh, a little bit later in this presentation here but to get you going here we'll have a look at what these pulses kind of look like uh, as uh, the rotor spins it will um, approach the pickup and then it will go away from the pickup and then it'll come and then it'll approach the pickup and then it'll go away from the pickup so every time uh, that detector senses um, the blade coming closer it counts it as a sort of a sine kind of wave or an oscillating wave here and that voltage that builds up and drops off re represents a specific uh, volume of fluid so one pulse represents a specific volume of fluid So we can calculate uh, the volumes of fluid based on the number of pulses and the size of the uh, turbine meter itself. And that frequency uh, of the output of the magnetic pickup is proportional to the flow rate. So we can then calculate the flow using this magical formula here. Uh, frequency is equal to our K factor times the flowing velocity. Frequency for F. Q for flow rate, K for pulses per unit volume. And our K factor is usually unique to each device. The device will come stamp, stamped with a uh, as-built K factor on it, which represents the number of pulses per uh, unit of volume. Um, and from that, we can calculate um, the flow rate. So here's an example of some math. Uh, dealing with turbine meters and flow rate. A liquid flow run has a maximum expected flow rate of 500 liters per minute. Calculate the maximum frequency output if the turbine meter's K factor is 50 pulses per gallon. So they're never going to make it nice and easy for you and have liters here and liters here. Uh, so we need to be aware of the uh, basic conversion factor between gallons and liters per minute. And generally accepted uh, one US gallon is the equivalent of 3.785 liters. So that's how we do our conversion. So to do this math here, basically what we gotta do is 
we do some conversion to get liters to uh, gallons, and then we can use um, that math uh, to figure out what the maximum frequency generated is. So our K factor is 50 pulses per gallon. Our flow is 500 liters a minute. So to convert that to gallons per minute, 500 liters divided by 3.785 gives us 132.1 US gallons per minute. This is per minute. And remember, frequency is counted in seconds. So now we have to convert into seconds. So our maximum frequency is going to be um, 50 for our K factor times 132 US gallons per minute is going to give us 6,605 pulses per minute. Now we're going to divide that by 60 in order to convert it to seconds. And now we're down to 110.08 hertz or 110.08 pulses per second, representing 500 liters per minute, which happens to be 132 US gallons. So the math is uh, not tremendously difficult, but they do throw a couple of twists in there, the gallons to liters conversion and the seconds to minutes conversions uh, are the only things that you really have to be conscious of. So another example here, uh, just quickly here, a flow meter has a K factor of 250.2 pulses per gallon. What is the flow rate in liters per minute if the frequency is 417 hertz? So just another flip-flop of the, of the same formula here, uh, making sure that you're uh, competent in doing your conversions between uh, gallons and liters and seconds. Uh, in minutes. So in order to do this one here, first we're going to calculate how many pulses there are going to be in a minute. We have 417 per second. Multiply that by 60 seconds in a minute. That is 25,020 pulses per minute. Second, we're going to calculate the number of U.S. gallons. So 2,520 pulses every minute. Every 250.2 pulses is a gallon. So therefore we have 100 U.S. gallons per minute. Last step is to convert 100 U.S. gallons per minute into liters. So 100 U.S. gallons times 3.75 liters per every gallon is 378.5 liters per minute. So the math is uh, not uh, that bad. And we see this uh, math, uh, the K factor math and the frequency math in a few devices moving forward. So, so it is important that we uh, wrap our, our heads on around being able to do this math. Okay, let's look at some construction uh, of gas turbines here. And there are slight differences between uh, gas turbines and liquid turbines. Um, and we'll just look at some of the uh, commonalities and some of the distinct uh, differences. So gas turbines basically work on the same principles as liquid turbines. Is that gas is a lower intensity, which means they have uh, less uh, driving force. Uh, so we need um, driving force to rotate that uh, rotor. So, what we usually do uh, for a gas turbine meter is some type of a, a physical uh, construction feature here, which is um, the velocity of of the veins, uh, thus generating uh, more gravity force. So that's a distinct thing between the turbines and the liquid turbines. You, you won't see any kind of people thing like this to reduce the fluid or get to, to have the force uh, stronger. Uh, another between gas turbines, uh, liquid turbines generally comes in, uh, in vertical kind of things, uh, other than again, because gas turbines. Um, don't have as much sacrifice in the flow. Uh, they should be made easier to fail you to get uh, all of the things together in the section where we'll talk about different things. There's a turbine there, a little bit of a reason that have that key area through that reduces the weight and increases the Okay, the lighter weight rotors, so uh, Usually, uh, 
usually get away. I recommend can be figured to measure vibrational flow. Uh, if you uh, talk about the uh, other thing, you're talking about something that is the rapid flow and the tech farm and MTA, uh, it's great. Uh, the way they do this is by adding an additional set of pickups um, at 90 degrees and that phase relationships uh, between the two of them is used to calculate flow in the opposite direction so you can tell the relationship to uh, if one is uh, in phase ahead or in phase behind, they can tell the direction of the rotation uh, and that's sh shown here on this graph. So bi-directional devices. Accuracy for turbine meters, they are very accurate, uh, often used in hydrocarbon custody transfer devices. That's why they're so popular in industry here in Alberta. Uh, ratings are about plus or minus 0.25% on linearity, so very linear, and 0.02% of reading uh, for accuracy, and that's a pretty good reading number, uh, and 10 to 1 turn down. And again, turn down is an uh, indication of how accurately can I measure throughout a wide operating range. So if I had a thousand liter per minute turbine meter with a 10 to one turndown ratio, it means that I would be just as accurate measuring at a thousand liters as I would be at a hundred liters. <clears throat> so let's look at some turbine meter components. Blown up view here of a turbine meter, some type of a uh, meter body uh, stator ring, stator, which is uh, the components that are inside the body of the uh, meter that are supporting uh, the shaft that supports the rotor. Uh, within that, there will be some bearings and it can be as complex as this or simpler or some combination. Uh, the rotor, the stator, the shaft, the bearings, the body, uh, of course, some type of a pickup, and then, of course, uh, a transmitter. Uh, which usually has this preamplifier in there. Of course, the preamplifier we learned uh, in different lectures is there to amplify the relatively small signal that is generated by the pickup so that the transmitter can uh, use that information. Uh, last item on here that isn't really shown is called the totalizer, uh, which is basically the, uh, it is the totalizer. It keeps track of the uh, running total of the flow uh, through the meter throughout history. A little more detail here looking at uh, rotors. Um, described in the ILM on pages 8 and 9, there are two basic rotor designs, uh, relatively simple to distinguish the single rotor design and the dual rotor design. So here's a single rotor uh, supported by uh, the stators in the body here with some bearings in it and that's a single rotor. Sometimes they will uh, rim the rotor. Uh, this has to do with allowing uh, more or less magnets. Uh, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit uh, in more detail when we talk about the different types of pickups. Um, but there is some type of a, a reaction between a, a mag magnetism and a coil uh, which is generating these pulses. Uh, and something has to do that. So there's different ways to do it, and we'll talk about uh, that later. But by having this rimmed rotor, uh, it, it avails us the opportunity to add more or less magnets on here, which will increase or decrease the amount of pulses that get generated. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Second type of rotor is the dual rotor, quite uh, self-explanatory if you're looking at it here. Uh, and the big benefit of the dual rotor here um, is it gets a much higher turndown ratio, uh, so a, a lot wider operating range with uh, maintained accuracy. Uh, and these rotors, um, again, because it's bi-directional, may spin in opposite directions depending on which way the flow goes, and they may have opposing angles on the fins as well, but uh, that's not necessarily that important. Um, we don't get into the details that deeply, but single rotor, dual rotor is what we're looking at here. Um, something we haven't seen in a previous diagram here is these straightening vanes. We've often called this uh, the stator, which supports the shaft and the bearings and the rotors. Um, but the stator is often an integrated piece uh, that includes some straightening vanes uh, inside of it. And the purpose of straightening vanes is to, uh, again, condition the flow 
to make it acceptable in terms of uh, turbulence or Reynolds number um, for the proper operation of the device. So you'll see that quite a bit in most turbine meters will have uh, configuration of the stator that it doubles as uh, straightening vanes or a flow conditioner. Okay, stators, uh, looking at these pieces here are the stationary components in the meter that support the rotor shaft and bearings, uh, often with straightening vanes built in to condition the flow. So again, here's the difference between uh, this diagram, have a look at this, uh, this stator compared to this stator. Uh, if I showed you these two diagrams and I said, which one of these two turbine meters would you suspect is a gas turbine meter? And I showed you this one, and then I showed you this one, you should uh, be able to distinguish that because of this larger body in here decreasing the flow area, this is a gas style, this is a liquid style. So there we go. Okay, bearings. A uh, critical part of any turbine is the bearings. It makes them spin and they are very delicate devices. Uh, these bearings are, of course, designed for a long life, but they do wear out. Uh, and as they wear out, that will change the readings of our, our flow meter. So different types of bearings that are discussed in the ILM in order of quality. Uh, first one here, A, is called a jewel pivot bearing. They have the least amount of drag. And as I said earlier, these are typically the ones that you're going to find in a gas meter because the gas meters are uh, daintier, for lack of a better word there. Uh, same kind of jewel mechanism you would find if you had an expensive watch and it's at a 25 jewel movement. That just means that its bearings are pivoting uh, on, on jewels and they're like rubies or sapphires, sapphires or whatever they are. Okay, second type of bearing here is a ball type bearing uh, like this, a little less uh, a little less complicated, and then the last type here is uh, a journal bearing or almost a bushing. Uh, this have the most drag, uh, and these are most common uh, for liquids. Uh, you'll find often if you don't use a turbine meter and it has these types of bearings, they often bind up uh, and seize, and you have to disassemble the piping, and, and you usually can get them to spin again. Okay, so moving on to the probably most important parts. Uh, of the turbine meter are the pickups. Uh, and I said earlier, there's a few different ways um, that we can pick up uh, the rotation of that rotor. And it is sensed uh, generally uh, three ways. The first way is mechanical, and they kind of taken that out of um, the ILM. It's not really mentioned in it there anymore, but um, turbine meters used to be uh, and still are in some applications connected mechanically using gears and shafts uh, that just connect the, the rotor to the totalizer on the top. Um, we're not really talking about those. We're talking about point number two here, which is uh, some type of a magnetic style pickup. Uh, and this is most common. Uh, we look specifically at two, a reluctance type pickup and an inductance type pickup. And then lastly, uh, the third one that we look at is an optical style pickup. Uh, which uh, detects disruptive light beams um, relative to the, the pulse output from the turbine meter. Okay, so again, just touching on these mechanical speed sensors uh, real briefly here. Uh, rotors coupled through gears to a mechanical totalizer, not much we need to really know about that, but they do exist. Uh, magnetic pickups, main focus of the ILM here. Um, two types of coils. Again, first type is reluctance. The second type is inductance. And with either of the two above methods, a pulse, uh, magnetic pulse or voltage is generated as some type of a magnetic uh, interaction with a coil occurs. And we'll look at uh, the differences between the two of them uh, individually here. Every one of those pulses we learned earlier represents a specific volume of flow. So real easy uh, visual here to put the two types of pickups uh, together uh, side by side so you can uh, see kind of what they look at look like here there are differences in the construction uh, of the body here you'll see we have permanent magnet mounted in the pickup on the reluctance uh, style and you'll see the permanent magnet is in the rotor on the inductance style so that's one main significant difference here uh, and that would also mean that the, the magnet is opposite in the pickups as well. Um, 
there's more details to it. Um, and then we'll talk about that uh, as I discuss each of these ones individually. So first, reluctance. Um, but that's the major difference is where is where is the magnet is a good question you can ask yourself. And if it's in the if it's in the uh, sensor, it's reluctance. And if it's in the uh, rotor, it's inductance. But a little more detail uh, coming up here next. So first, reluctance, pick up coils. Again, permanent magnet mounted in the uh, detector. And you'll see what it says over here, one pulse per blade. So because the magnet is in the detector, every time this blade approaches, it builds like this. As it's at its peak, as it sits here right now, it's at its peak. And then as it moves away, it comes down. The next blade approaches, comes up to its peak, and gets counted. So that's the big thing about reluctance. A permanent magnet is in the pickup. The magnetic lines of flux are concentrated by its cone shape. Cone shape focusing the flux down here towards the area where the fins will be. And when the blade passes by the lines of flux, those lines of flux move with the blade because it has lower reluctance, creating this wonderful wave here. <clears throat> and every time that happens, a voltage is produced. And as a result, this gives one pulse per blade. And I always say that it reluctantly counts every single blade. This will make different. Uh, this will make sense in a second when we look at inductance style pickup. Oops, a little too far there. So inductance style pickup here again. Permanent magnet is either in the rotor or the shroud. So rotor or the shroud, somewhere in the spinning part here, pick up the coil of wire surrounding a soft iron core, ding, 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 and the flux from the rotor passes through the coil of voltage is induced, same idea as the previous one, but this type of meter produces one pulse per revolution. So somewhere on here, on one of these fans or one point on the shroud, there's a magnet, and every time it comes around, it gets counted once. So that's why I said the other one, it counts a lot more, so it reluctantly counts more. This one, the inductance only counts once per revolution. So that's the big difference between the two of them, uh, aside from construction. <clears throat> the last detector type I would look at is optical sensing here. There we have uh, flow coming through, the rotator blade spinning, and then a pickup that's detecting uh, the light. Okay, so uh, light beam is disrupted by the blade rotation, resulting in a pulsed output, just like a strobe light uh, at the club. Is that a question? Oh, I can't see anything else. So if that's a question, I'll get it uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, second last component is preamplifier. Uh, again, signal generated in the flow meters uh, are small, micro or Miller had. Uh... I can't see my chat page right now. So if you could translate, that would be great. Sorry, Tyler, I'll get. Back to your question. Uh, the, Tyler was just mentioning that the uh, ILM mentioned. Mentions what? Oh, All right. sorry, I thought you were talking either. Um, he mentioned that the ILM says that uh, the reluctance uh, counts one pulse per revolution. I'm just scanning to see that, but. Uh, well, that would be a mistake. That would be a mistake. That is a mistake. That same sentence is in both paragraphs. So 
the PowerPoint I'm not distracted. seeing it in my version of the ILM. I have uh, I have version 22, and on page 13, the last sentence in each of them is exactly the same, and that's a mistake. Although the first paragraph looks like the text is lighter in mine, so I'm right. The ILM is wrong. Okay, we'll move on. We'll talk about that after, but uh, I am correct. The ILM is wrong. Reluctance counts every blade. Inductance counts one per rotation. Okay, so again, uh, here we have the preamplifier, which amplifies the signal from the sensor, increases its amplitude, uh, turns it into a square pulse that's much stronger, and then that's used by the transmitter. Last but not least is the totalizer, which, as I said earlier, just accumulates all the pulses and then uh, through some uh, math and circuitry will display a total uh, flow value. So uh, the frequency signal from the turbine meter can either uh, go to some type of a scaling and it will output uh, some type of uh, running total for you. So what does the totalizer do? Let's have some totalizer math in here. Uh, again, this is very similar to the math we've done earlier. Uh, turbine meter has a K factor of 2,210 pulses per US gallon. We need it to count in liters, of course. What K factor should we set into the totalizer to convert it to liters? So we have to convert uh, 2,210 pulses for every gallon. One gallon is 3.785 liters. So we divide those two together and we end up with 583.88 pulses per liter. So that will be our new K factor. If the flow rate of the above meter is 20 liters per minute, what is the frequency? So we have 583 pulses for every liter times 20 liters is 11,677.6 pulses in a minute. Divide that by 60 and our frequency would be 194.62 hertz. So again, uh, minutes to seconds, liters to gallons, that's pretty big in this ILM. The last piece of the machine is the display unit. Uh, in mechanical displays, the K factor is set by using the gearing, but again, no longer really relevant in this ILM. Uh, in the electronic meters, the output is a series of pulses, uh, and you'll usually see a pulse output on a turbine meter. Uh, the pulses, of course, counted in total to give the total fluid volume. And the frequency of the pulses can also be measured, giving us the flow rate. So wonderful, wonderful machines there. And if I said, looking at the picture on the screen, what kind of a flow meter is that? Gas or liquid? And you hopefully will say gas. Alrighty. Uh, coming into the last turn here, uh, piping and installation considerations here. So you'll see some commonalities uh, in lots of these devices as we go through here when we're talking about this fully, fully developed flow, when we start talking more about Reynolds numbers and all that kind of thing. Um, generally, in a perfect world, we want this kind of a flow profile. Uh, and uh, we do what we can to get it, whether it's natural or whether we use straightening veins or some type of flow conditioning. Uh, but particular here to turbine meters, <clears throat> disturbances upstream can affect your accuracy. Pretty general statement for all flow devices. Straight pipe lengths may have to be up to 50 diameters upstream. That's a lot. Using flow straighteners can reduce the straight pipe requirements down to 10 diameters upstream. So you'll see. That's why the construction generally, as you'll see here, includes some type of a wicked engineering design to help to straighten out that flow rate. So that's kind of cool. Okay, pressure drop. Uh, because we got something here in the flow stream, there's a big pressure drop across the turbine meter. Okay, to avoid uh, cavitation, which is an inherent problem with devices that have big pressure drops, 
uh, we have high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other side, and what happens is uh, the liquid flashes off uh, and then the blade gets all crazy and spinning fast and all kinds of bad things can happen. Uh, so we want to avoid cavitation if we can. Uh, the ILM uh, recommends some very specific numbers that I've decided to include in this uh, presentation here and that back pressure. Uh, should be one point times the vapor pressure at, a, at the given temperature that it's operating, and it should be two times the pressure drop across the meter. Now, this isn't something that you're going to be able to calculate. Uh, you're not engineers, um, but if you do have cavitation issues, um, you can act kind of smart and say, hey, maybe we can put a, a back pressure regulator on this and we can uh, help fix that up. A uh, couple other things that you can do. Uh, you can pick a better size flow meter. Um, another, you know, it's another option. It's a little bit more difficult to change the piping size. Um, but putting that regulator in there uh, to increase the back pressure is probably the easiest uh, thing that you can do. All right, again, um, moving to the daintiness of a turbine meter because they have these uh, fancy bearings and very lightweight rotors and they spin and they're need to be free spinning. Uh, as a result, they're really only good for pretty clean flows. Um, so if we don't have a flow that we can be certain is clean, we have to put some hardware upstream to make sure that we don't damage it, break it, plug it up, wear it out, uh, whatever it might be. Um, primarily, we're talking about things like strainers and filters uh, in place to keep fibrous material away from the blades, uh, which may, may impair uh, free rotation. So we want to make sure that it's clean going in. Uh, another thing that we want to make sure is that um, if we have uh, air in liquids or liquids in airs, we, we remove uh, we remove the unwanted uh, components. Uh, we, can do, we can remove the air uh, from a liquid using an air eliminator. Uh, and this is important to prevent something called overspeeding. Uh, if it's usually measuring uh, water through a turbine it's spinning at a certain rate relative to to that water um, usually pretty fast when the water is spinning it and then if a slug of air comes uh, through the piping that rotor will slow down because the air doesn't have as much density so it doesn't spin as fast and then the problem comes when the next slug of water comes along and hammers that turbine and causes it to speed up really fast uh, and that's something that they call overspeeding and that can be damaging uh, to a turbine meter. Okay, sizing of turbine meter, uh, they're sized according to flow rate, not pipe size. You'll often, uh, you'll often see them uh, in the field. They're always much smaller than the, than the pipe size. Uh, the reason for that is if they were at the same size as the line, uh, typically the velocity going through them would not be high enough uh, for them to work properly. So sizing uh, as, a, as a very broad rule across the board is the turbine meters are gonna be smaller than the process piping that they're installed in. Which leads us to the next section, which is wonderful uh, on how, how do you connect them? What type of connections are there? Well, putting them into the piping uh, can, can be any type of connection really. Uh, threaded is very common, uh, grooved maybe depending on your industry can be common, flanged, wafers, uh, all kinds of different mounting connections. Uh, we don't really need to get into the details of them. Okay, maintenance calibration. Not a lot of things we can do with the turbine meter in terms of uh, maintenance and calibration. Basically limited cleaning and testing. Uh, testing a turbine meter, uh, you'll find later in the ILM, um, I'm mentioning it here instead, just because uh, I think it goes to, it goes better here. But they do mention a spin test uh, at the end of the ILM, which is essentially taking the meter out of the process piping, bringing it to the shop, and hitting it with a regulated blast of compressed air, and timing how long the rotor spins, uh, recording that time. Uh, and, and then over history, as you do subsequent testing, uh, if the spin time decreases, uh, you can use as a, that as an indicator of the health of the bearings. So it's not particularly scientific, but it does, uh, it does work and it is mentioned in the ILM as, as the spin test. Um, the reason we're worried about it is uh, with wear, 
uh, the K factor might change. Uh, and as a result, uh, we'll have to do a calibration on it. And a calibration on it basically involves doing a uh, meter verification check and then deriving uh, a meter factor that we'll apply uh, to compensate for the deterioration, which has made our K factor uh, not as accurate as it used to be. Okay, so let's get into some more painful accuracy stuff here. Um, showing you what an accuracy curve uh, for a turbine meter looks like. Um, note the bump on the turbine meter, uh, the bump or turbine meter bump. Um, if this operating range is avoided, the linearity is much better. So straightforward, all we're saying here is we're talking about this bump right here from, from startup zero to about 35, 20, 35% or so the accuracy uh, is not consistent. Once you get over about 300 and something gallons here to the full range, we have really consistent accuracy uh, in this range here. So um, this is generally where we want to operate. This is why sizing is important. If your meter is too big, uh, you're not going to have the flow and you're going to be down here. Um, you want to make sure that it's sized correctly. This also works uh, with some turn down ratio math uh, that is included in the ILM that I'm not going to get into in this presentation here. Uh, it talks about this 15% linearity. That's the linearity between the operating range from here to here is about 15%, although it says plus or minus 0.25. Uh, the statement they're making is that it's about 0.15. Uh, and you can use that. Uh, in conjunction with your uh, turndown ratio uh, to do some calculations. So if I know uh, my accuracy statement, I can say, okay, where does my accuracy start dropping off or where do I get out of this range? And then I can say I have this accuracy statement based on this turndown ratio or this accuracy statement based on this turndown ratio. Um, but I'm not going to get into the details here. Okay, next, the um, probably only thing mentioned that uh, affects uh, the output of a turbine meter is viscosity. Uh, mentioned specifically, viscosity uh, increases the turndown ratio and accuracy decreases. There's a little bit of spelling there, accuracy decreases. So you'll see what happens here. Uh, ever-changing accuracy uh, throughout most of its range and has really only a small area um, where its accuracy is good. So as a result, its turndown ratio is going to be much smaller. We're taking this big of a span versus this big of a span. So viscosity does have a pretty significant effect on turbine meters. Moving into the final straight here, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of turbine meters. Uh, accuracy, about a quarter of a percent. Uh, rangeability, about 10 to 1. And that varies um, accurately, usually goes up as your rangeability uh, comes down. Uh, they are linear in output. They have high flow capacity. They're easier to, easy to mount because there's many different styles. Uh, disadvantages are expensive. A uh, half inch one on the flow trainer in the shop is $600 or $800, something like that. Uh, high pressure loss, again, because they're impeding the flow stream. Uh, compensation of the K factor must be made for changes in fluid density and or wear. Uh, may require strainers, et cetera. Uh, that's related to the fact that they need clean fluids. So overall, pretty universally uh, a usable device, uh, very common here in uh, Alberta. So that would be uh, technically the end of the ILM. Uh, there's a couple slides I just want to show you that are outside of the ILM, just so you're aware. I'm not sure why they got the why they got removed. Uh, possibly they got moved to electronics. I'm not sure, um, but we know that the output of a turbine meter is generally a pulse, and as a result. Um, we usually need some type of a frequency to analog converter because most of our control systems, uh, all 
all of our control systems will definitely have four to 20 wiring. If you don't have a pulsed input card, uh, you'll have to convert from a pulse to four to 20. So to do that, you need a frequency to analog converter. Just, just throwing that out there. Uh, and then of course, there's some uh, math involved with converting frequency to analog. So it's not crazy math. I'm just gonna leave it in here so that you can look at it. But basically all you're doing is saying, uh, what is my output going to be at zero hertz? Uh, and most often it's going to be four milliamps. And what is going to be my frequency at 20 milliamps? Uh, and then that's just doing some of that wonderful liters to gallon, seconds to uh, minutes conversions. So that is uh, the end of this presentation uh, for turbine meters. So again, uh, in the ILM, it does say that reluctance and inductance are the same and only count one per revolution. That is not true. Reluctance counts every magnet or every blade and inductance counts once per revolution. So reluctantly counts many or only counts one. The end. <laughs>